Hi, Tom. How are you doing today? Very well, Gilbert. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're glad to have you here. Maybe you can just share with us a bit of an overview about your company. Yeah, sure. Pulsar Helium, as, as the name suggests, it's all about the helium. So we're a, an explorer and developer of, uh, of helium, which most uh, surprisingly not many people know that we do get it from the ground. Um, so with the other industrial gases, uh, most of those come from the, uh, the air that we breathe. But uh, the helium coming from the ground, it's a bit more strategic and a bit harder to, uh, to find. So we're focused on uh, exploring the helium where it's the primary product. Uh, where it's not associated with hydrocarbon production. And that's where most of the helium comes from today. And uh, our projects, uh, we've got our flagship project, which is called Topaz, which is in Minnesota in the USA. And then we have uh, two new project, which is in Greenland. So let's delve in a bit on the, the, the whole background market information on the helium, because most uh, investors or our audience may not understand uh, too well, because it's sort of a... Uh, not very familiar with the whole story. Maybe you can give us a bit about the background, the market dynamics of it, and then sort of like, is that a new application or why should investors basically follow in this, this niche market? Mm. I got involved in the helium industry about 10 years ago now. So, uh, so that was really when uh, the world was first made aware that there was a, a shortage of helium. So in the past, it's uh, you know cheap helium party balloons. That's that's basically what we were we knew about. Uh, but it's been uh, it's been quite a steep learning curve. Uh, helium, uh, I may be biased, but I find it quite fascinating. So so it's used mostly in uh, in technology. So uh, uh, in order to fabricate semiconductors, you need to have uh, liquid helium. Uh, for MRI scanners, uh, in order for the uh, for the uh, magnet to uh, superconduct, you need to have liquid helium. To make fiber optic cables, you need helium. Uh, for the testing in batteries for electric vehicles, you need to have helium. And the list goes on. So it's it's worth saying that party balloons, uh, whilst uh, you know a market, it's only about three percent of the market share. The rest is all going to the big end of town. Uh, also for space launches as well. So in, in rockets going off and putting uh, satellites in orbit, uh, they use uh, quite a vast amount of helium as well. So those are its major applications. And in terms of where it comes from, uh, it really is, it's, so it's geological, it's in the ground. Uh, you need to find it in a reservoir, which is very similar to say natural gas. Um, and sometimes you can get the natural gas with helium where they're mixed together. Uh, but for us, we look where the helium is uh, uh, the primary economic driver of the project, not hydrocarbons. And so there you get a uh, higher grade uh, of helium. Uh, you also get exposure to the, to the helium price as well, which has just been exponential really for the past uh, decade since the sh shortage started. Uh, and really that's uh, so for, let's say with uh, natural gas, uh, for a thousand cubic feet of natural gas, it's about four dollars for American dollars. Uh, for helium, for liquid helium, you're seeing prices in excess of a thousand dollars for the same unit of measurement. So it's a very valuable commodity. Um, and the reason for the shortage is, well, it's being used in more technical applications now. Uh, so definitely demand has increased. But on the other side, the supply really has uh, stagnated or, or declined. Uh, so the USA, which is the world's uh, you know, biggest consumer of helium, uh, was also the, the largest producer of helium, but not anymore. And that's really uh, due to the, the age of the, uh, of the gas fields. It's, they're quite old. Uh, they've been uh, producing for a long period of time, and uh, now they're depleted. Uh, so that really created an opportunity for new entrants in the market. And uh, the world's largest producer now is out of Qatar. Uh, so Qatar gas, um, so as a byproduct of their natural gas production. Um, so out of all the industrial gases, definitely helium is, is the most uh, strategic of the lot, being the one that's in the ground and quite hard to uh, to identify. So it's, uh, it's an exciting place and it's fun to talk about because really we uh, not many people know how much helium actually impacts uh, our lives. Everything from our telephone to the computer I'm I'm talking to you on now. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned a little bit of the producers, the bigger companies. So, who are the major players in, in in this industry in terms of the producing part, and how do you position Pulsar to to be part of this? Because you're still early stage, you're still junior company. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, about ninety five percent of the world's helium that's produced today uh, is a byproduct of natural gas. 
so uh, now that the shortage is there and the price has gone up, we can start to look at these primary projects that are not associated with hydrocarbons and also got a much cleaner footprint as well, of course. So, so the, the largest producers, uh, Qatar Gas in Qatar, uh, Exxon Mobil in the USA, uh, and then uh, another one is in Algeria uh, from natural gas production there. And then you've got uh, some smaller operations, uh, uh, particularly in North America. Uh, so to, to find that, uh, that, uh, that primary helium is really limited to Africa and North America, uh, the locations to look, and you know, uh, with Pulsar being in North America. Uh, but then what the, uh, the hydrocarbon companies do is they then would then sell the gas on to a distribution company. Uh, so the big ones there are Air Liquide, um, Air Products, uh, and Linde. They're the top three. And so they would then uh, obtain the, uh, the, the helium and then distribute it to, around the world to where it needs to go. So where we see ourselves fitting into the Pulsar uh, is that uh, with our main asset, the one in the USA, Topaz project, it's extremely high concentration. So what we have is 10.5% helium uh, in, the, in the raw gas. Uh, to put that in perspective, what does it mean? Uh, anything with a concentration that's more than 0.3% is uh, considered to be of uh, economic uh, interest, potentially a uh, viable uh, operation. So to have 10.5% really is uh, top of its class. Um, so uh, what we see is, is that we're, uh, it's being drilled, it's being discovered, and what we're doing now is in December, so not too far away now, uh, we're, we're drilling uh, an appraisal well. So effectively what that is, is it's already been drilled, it's been discovered. We're now going back in with a rig which has more testing equipment with it to then get the data about the, the size of the reservoir. How big is it, what, what we're looking at here? Uh, and then after that, we can then start to talk about what would production scenarios look like, uh, how much uh, helium could uh, Pulsar potentially produce, and then start to uh, discuss things like offtake agreements directly with the end users and cutting out those uh, middleman distribution companies, which I think is the most uh, lucrative way to move forward. But then also we have the ability being primary helium really to uh, increase or decrease production to whatever the market needs. And this is what's really missing right now is that say with the natural gas companies, they're not going to increase their output of natural gas for the sake of the helium because it's only a small credit to the overall operation. Whereas to be the primary economic driver, you really have that ability to be able to give the market what it wants, bring some stability back. So you mentioned you have a key project here in the US, and uh, you, I also learned that you also have another project in Greenland too. So any strategic mm. reasons on in operating these areas? Yeah, definitely. With with the USA, with Topaz, uh, it's the place to be is the USA. That's the single largest market for helium uh, and also experiencing the probably the, 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 uh, the, the, the biggest problem with the shortage at the moment as well. So having it in country uh, is a real big accolade. Um, but these, these projects are notoriously hard to find, uh, these primary helium projects. So really, it was uh, with our project in the USA, it was a discovery by chance. Uh, so it, uh, they were actually looking for nickel at the time, and they uh, they drilled and instead hit uh, uh, very high concentration helium gas. Uh, so it was after that that uh, we got involved. Uh, and then with our project in Greenland, we generated that one in-house. Uh, so that is a, a brand new helium discovery, and uh, we are the, uh, the first mover in Greenland, uh, and also the, the first mover for helium in Minnesota as well. So we've got that first mover advantage and the ability to take out uh, the uh, the key license areas uh, of interest. So it's important to know uh, about the, the companies, also the team behind it, the background of your team. Can you tell us some highlights of your, your team because uh, in exploring uh, and discovering this special commodity helium? Mm. Well, I've got, I'm very fortunate. I've got an excellent team around me. So, uh, well, look, starting with myself, uh, I, I've got about 10 years experience. And so that's been around the world, uh, so Africa, North America. Uh, we've got um, in Europe, of course. Uh, so with that, uh, I've been involved in every stage. So from the identification, the licensing, uh, the, uh, the development, uh, but then also in discussions with uh, the distribution companies and end users. So over that decade, I've really been able to uh, get a network in every walk of life for, for Helium. Uh, 
Uh, my background is a geologist, so uh, technical background there. Uh, then with my colleagues, we've got uh, our chairman, Neil Herbert. Uh, so he has a financial background. Uh, he has uh, been involved in the helium industry as well for about seven years now. Uh, so, uh, but uh, he's, uh, uh, he's been excellent. Uh, he's had a lot of success in the past with other resource companies. Um, so commodities like uranium and copper. And now with helium, I think he sees that uh, what's most exciting is that supply demand fundamental and, and having an asset like Pulsar does in the USA and how that could really disrupt uh, supply. Uh, we then have our technical manager, uh, Josh Blewett. Uh, so uh, he and I, uh, we started up a, a helium company a decade ago together. Uh, so he's there really digging into the geology of our projects. And then we have a, an operations manager uh, as well. Uh, so American, Michael Sturdy, uh, he's currently out on site uh, as we as I talk uh, in Minnesota. So um, yeah, a very capable team. And the good thing is that with helium being such a, a new commodity to look for, I, I think that uh, we're probably one of the most experienced teams out there, to be honest. So in summary, let's say investors understand this, the strong fundamentals of helium, this uh, special sector. So why should mm. you know, they be uh, considering investing into your company? Because there may be a few other uh, helium companies in the market. So why should they be following your company instead? I think that the, the key strengths that we have, so the, the team, of course, uh, I think that uh, with uh, being the first mover in the projects as well, is that we are uh, in locations uh, that have never been looked at for, for helium or, or any form of gas before. So uh, whereas perhaps with the other listed companies that are out there, they're exploring in areas which are very known and established gas fields. So I think that in terms of the, the blue sky, the, the, the ability for scale, is something that we really have. And then also having the, the high concentration of 10.5%, it is just so extraordinarily high. I mean, if, it, if you compare it to, say, gold, it's like, uh, you know, running kilos per ton. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that kind of scale. So I think, by, like all commodities, grade is king. And uh, if there were any future fluctuations in the helium price, having that extremely high grade, uh, would uh, be able to um, to to weather any uh, price differentials. Great to hear. So thank you, Tom, for sharing your story with us here today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.